Today at the National Press Club, broadcaster Alan Jones. During a career spanning more than 25 years, the radio host has dominated the Sydney market. Mr Jones has also coached the Australian Rugby Union side. Today, Alan Jones speaks on food security and the protection of the Australian regional way of life. From the National Press Club. Ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen, sorry, welcome to the National Press Club and today's National Australia Bank Address. Our guest today uh, needs very little introduction. He was described last night on the ABC, I noticed, as um, the most powerful broadcaster in the land. So uh, he's certainly uh, well known to people. Uh, Alan Jones uh, has, is a controversial figure. He uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, shy away from controversy, as is well known. And uh, he's going to talk to us today about food security and the Australian way of life. Alan, I'm glad to see that uh, you, you didn't encounter any uh, border restrictions when you came to the ACT, unlike the uh, convoy of no confidence not so long ago. Um, and uh, so without further ado, Alan Jones. Thank you, Mark. Um, and ladies and gentlemen, I must say I noted that in the correspondence of July 21, when Morris Riley was writing to me about this, the topic was sport, rugby, media and politics. And quote, can we fix the Wallabies culture in time for the World Cup? Uh, I'm still happy to do that, by the way, but I think it's just a touch late. Um, having suggested then that the title of the speech was entirely up to me, somewhere along the line it was confirmed by the club that the title of the address should be Australia's National Interest, Food Security and the Protection of the Australian Regional Way of Life. I have to confess that I am more than delighted that an opportunity has been given for these issues to be canvassed nationally. But may I say at the outset, I'm simply talking about our land that has fed the Australian people for the past 200 years. And without seeking permission from the Australian community at either an election or a referendum, our politicians are turning some of our best land into a quarry and a worthless lunar moonscape. The great artesian basin and our underground aquifers are being risked for the next 200 years by fracking and the use of toxic chemicals. Scientists admit that nobody fully understands the complex interconnectivity of these systems or how they really work. Yet no matter where I go in the bush, salt is the elephant in the room, the one thing that politicians and the mining companies don't want to talk about. The truth is there are no solutions for all the mountains of salt that will be dragged to the surface at every coal seam gas site. Ask any farmer, any scientist, any ordinary suburban gardener what salt will do to their soil and they'll tell you. May I say this firstly? I come from the land in Western Queensland, a land of drought. I know the worth of water. I grew up watching stock go without it, perishing in the drought. We have governments that are silly enough to give coal seam gas and coal mining companies the right to plunder our best agricultural land and as well extract half as much water out of the Great Artesian Basin as we know we can sustainably use. And on top of all of this, we're allowing some of our best agricultural land to be sold to foreign interests. Twice in the last month, the former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd has spoken on the issue of global food security. At a conference to agricultural scientists in Brisbane last month, he warned that governments must tackle global food security or risk, his words, wars, political chaos and large movements of environmental refugees, including to Australia. He wanted food security to be on the agenda of this week's Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Perth and the G20 meeting in Cannes in November. Mr Rudd told the scientists in Brisbane that global food production would need to increase by 70 per cent by the middle of the century to feed an expected world population of 9.3 billion. And he said, and I quote, failing to address the challenge of food insecurity would have political, social and broader social security repercussions. Mr Rudd said, Political conflict, war and large numbers of internally displaced people will be affecting all our countries. At about the same time, the Minister for Trade, Craig Emerson, also representing a Queensland seat, though born in New South Wales, predicted that exporting food to Asia would provide, his words, a massive opportunity 
for Australia to further cast in on the urbanisation of Asia. Well, most of us would agree with that. Dr Emerson said, as one billion extra people inhabit the region by 2035 and the proportion of Asia's population living in urban areas increases from 42 per cent to 55 per cent, the demand for protein-rich food, he said, is set to soar. The irony of those comments is that both Mr Rudd and Dr Emerson represent Queensland electorates. In nothing that they said did they make any reference to the fact that Queensland is allowing mining interests to plunder the very land that could guarantee our food security or, in Dr Emerson's words, guarantee a massive opportunity for Australia in Asia. The world's population is projected to increase dramatically in the next 50 years. Food shortages, as both Mr Rudd and Dr Emerson have said, are imminent. Yet the amount of Australian land dedicated to agriculture has fallen by 20 per cent since 1976. Since 1976, farmers have abandoned more than 100 million acres of land. Fed up, they sell to government, or overseas interests, or mining companies, or they are bamboozled by mining companies and don't know what to do. Our agricultural heritage is progressively being eroded. Let me begin by saying I'm not opposed to coal mining or coal seam gas mining. I'm opposed to the arrogance with which these people think they can go anywhere, do what they want and get away with it. There is a saying, when the light appears, the birds begin to sing. When the truth starts to come out, people find the courage to talk. People are not just talking now, I can assure you. They have decided in thousands to do something. They are locking the gate. And the mining industry, needing access to be able to function, have a monumental battle on their hands. This is not just a battle about mining prime farm land or destroying fresh water or covering our land with salt or risking public health. This is about something far more damaging and dangerous. The loss of our rights as Australian citizens, the loss of the basic freedoms we have always taken for granted. The state and federal governments have conspired to remove our rights over the ownership of our land. They have deliberately conspired to bully, to abuse and to force Australians into court if they don't comply with the demands of foreign-owned multinational mining companies. In fact, in Queensland, they issue special manuals as to how Australian farmers must behave in their negotiations with mining companies in tips for landholders negotiating agreements with resource companies issued by the Bly government in November last year, it says, quote, regardless of how you feel about the activities taking place on your land, you're encouraged to develop a courteous and cooperative working relationship towards the resource company. And in the next sentence they warn, quote, how costly, stressful and time consuming going to court will be. Santos recently made a presentation to the Stock Exchange. On the 26th of September, they presented slide after slide after slide to justify why Santos would be an excellent investment project. And these slides talked about Santos being strategically positioned for market access, their words. And they provided a map to the Stock Exchange, slide 23, of the Gunnedah Basin, telling investors, quote, Gunnedah Basin coals are world class, with appraisal programs confirming confidence and known resources in excess of 12,000 petajoules. Now, to give you some idea, New South Wales gas consumption currently is about 160 petajoules per annum. It's thought to grow to about 550 in the next 20 years. Santos is saying that Gunnedah alone has resources of 12,000 petajoules of gas. And they'll walk over or invade prime agricultural land to get it. And there's the map presented to the Stock Exchange. It mentions the towns, Gundawindi to Dubbo, taking in Moree, Walgut, Narrabri, Gunnedah, Tamworth, Crindai, Scone, Coonabarabran, Canamble and Gulgong. They're all there. This is amongst the finest agricultural land in the world. And Santos are currently running ads designed to induce in those who see them a sense of feeling that this is all pretty mundane, straightforward, very safe. Well, they don't tell you what the ads should tell us. They're frightened to show us a map of the gas wells and what they look like. They're frightened to show us a map of the all-weather roads that will needed 
that will be needed to service the gas wells. They are frightened to show us a map of the topsoil, which will need to be removed for pipe construction to connect the gas wells. They are frightened to tell us where the employees will go, because they will have recreational needs and they will need to be administrative quarters. They are frightened to tell us that these coal seam gas initiatives will become large industrial estates. They don't tell us any of this. They will require many, many hectares. Santos don't tell us how many compressors they will need. They don't tell us what they'll do with the gas or the water. They say nothing about the reverse osmosis treatment plant, which you'll be able to hear for miles. They don't tell us, once the water is treated, where you'll store it, because the volumes will be greater than several Sydney harbours. They don't tell us where they'll put the residue. They don't tell us where the salt will go or what it will do to the soil. They don't tell us that it's a 24-7 operation. In other words, they don't tell us what a fully blown gas field looks like. And the reason they don't tell us is they think farmers will cop this nonsense. Well, I've got news for Santos and others, the farmers won't, because what coal seam gas and open cut coal mining are making into industrial zones now, in 30 years, they'll be industrial wastelands. Read the Darling Downs, the Liverpool Plains, the Gloucester and Stroud Valleys, the Fitzroy Basin, Felton Valley, Vacus Marsh in, Tasma in Victoria. And have a look at the beautiful well camp on the edge of Toowoomba, destined to be an industrial zone and mining, of course. You name it, it's everywhere. And I say over and over again, have a look at open cut mining. Take a helicopter across the Hunter Valley. The land was supposed to be rehabilitated. It can't be. It's like a crater of the moon. Following the public meeting in Gunnedah last week, the second of its kind by angry farmers, the Sydney Morning Herald editorialised, and I quote, Decisions to exploit energy resources must not be made prematurely so that they preempt the decision to protect the best agricultural land in a continent where it is in short supply. There should be no hurry. There is reason to believe that Australia already has too many coal seam gas projects being developed all at once. It's time to pause, the editorial said. The gas does not degrade if it stays in the ground. There's plenty of time to devise a course of action which balances all interests. Now, I'm not talking melodrama here. I'm talking reality. I have seen elderly farmers pushed off their farms by New Hope Coal and paid so little for their land that they're forced to live out their lives as paupers. Yet because the farms were held under pre-1910 land releases, there is a significance in that, these farmers actually owned all the royalties to the coal under the land. But they didn't know that. And they're too afraid to talk to the media because they've been forced to sign confidentiality agreements. They are the victims of legalised theft. There are children living in coal seam gas regions who have constant headaches, nosebleeds and rashes. I've met them. Children li living next to open cut coal mines who have constant headaches, nosebleeds and rashes. I can name them. Their parents take them to the doctor. They're too afraid to talk to the media because they were forced to sign confidentiality agreements. How does a farmer manage? They're bullied and bamboozled out of their own farms by big gas companies who just move in on them. Good, decent Australian women who don't even have the basic Australian right to hang their washing out in the sun because their entire town is covered in coal dust. And of course, one of the reasons for this rush in mining development, and in particular coal seam gas development in New South Wales, is that the previous government in New South Wales granted a five-year exemption from paying royalties on coal seam gas extraction. That means the taxpayer of New South Wales is getting absolutely nothing back. It's not commonly known, but the right to mine royalties on many inner Darling Downs properties rests with the landowner. You see, these properties were freeholded prior to 1910 and therefore have a disproportionately higher value in private hands because the landowner has the right to any mineral royalties stemming from the land pre-1910. Now, mining companies knew that, but they preyed on the farmers who didn't. The farmer isn't informed. How would he be? And it's a royalty windfall for the mining companies. Surely a government should intervene immediately to stop miners from establishing themselves on pre-1910 freehold land. The royalty situation gives miners an incentive and an opportunity to buy the land without offering the original owner a premium equal to the capitalised value of the royalty saving. And since it gets no royalty, 
when this land is mined, the government can't guarantee any of the public benefits that should eventuate from royalties being paid to them. This should be addressed and corrected immediately. It's corrected, quite simply, by not granting prospective mining licences to operate on properties that were freeholded before 1910. Queensland has 300 years of coal at the current rate of extraction—300. Supplies should be sought from remote areas where conflicts with the existing patterns of settlement and land use would be minimal. When these issues were raised at Oakey earlier this year on the Darling Downs and then at Gunnar last week on the Liverpool Plains of New South Wales, they highlighted that we are witnessing the biggest land use issue here since native title. Farmers want to protect their land from takeover. Farmers are making simple points. They want to protect their land from intrusion. When Michael Caton argued in the movie The Castle that a man's home was his castle, we thought it was funny and it was a joke. It was a comedy. Now it's reality. When farmers at law have no right to stop mining interests entering their property. Well, they may have no right at law, but they are now being told to lock the gate and let no one in. Drew Hutton, known to me for years, has formed the Lock the Gate Alliance. It's not a national movement. It's bigger than that. And it's happening. They are fed income. Surely farmers would have the support of all Australia in their argument to protect underground water resources. Surely farmers would have the support of all Australia in their bid to go about producing food and fibre for an exploding global population. Surely farmers would have the support of all Australians who are serious about protecting our food supplies in the future and safeguarding valuable agricultural land. Make no mistake about it, farmers now are organised and they're calling upon Australians to rally behind them. You know, I've got the hunch that if America was founded on the promise of freedom and democracy, Australia was founded on the belief of giving everyone a fair go. Right now, it seems we've lost the promise of a fair go, and we've also lost our right to our basic democracy as well. And it's probably time that Australian people stepped up to take it back. Our politicians have forgotten that they're servants, not masters. They've forgotten that no politician, no political party and no government has the right to allow the destruction of our land and water, both of which are the true wealth of our nation. As far as the mining companies are concerned, this is just about money. As far as they are concerned, our land has no history, no story, no spirituality and no soul. Yet, if you were mistaken, you would think the Queensland Government agreed with the farmers. Its own website says, and I quote, growing national concern about land conservation has led to a realisation that good quality agricultural land is a finite resource that must be conserved and managed for the longer term. Protecting it from unnecessary development is essential for maintaining the future productivity and efficiency of Queensland's rural industries. They're kidding. 80% of Queensland is covered by exploration permits. 90% of the Darling Downs is covered by exploration permits. The Department of Prime Minister's map in New South Wales of petroleum title applications, current petroleum titles, gas sites and petroleum boreholes shows that two-thirds of New South Wales is the subject of some kind of petroleum, gas or coal seam application for development. And when I challenged the minister on this yesterday, he said, oh, I don't think that's right, Alan. So he's written me a letter overnight. And he said, no, the official figure is only 49.8%. 49 official figure. I don't think that's right because the Department of Primary Registries says something else. 49.8 per cent they admit to is the subject of expiration licence. It is impossible to believe that there's a Part 3A planning application process which allows an outfit called Apex Energy to drill next to the Warragamba Dam, Sydney's source of drinking water. And if that's approved, the drilling will start in January next year. Go down to the southern highlands of New South Wales, near the beautiful Sutton Forest. The Korean-owned Cockatoo Coal are going to begin drilling 120 holes. They've advised the 420 landowners in the area that they have plans for a coal exploration test bore on the front and rear borders of Nicole Kidman's Sutton Forest property. Residents object. They have no defence. In Gunnedah, where we were last Wednesday, more than 12 months ago, the Chinese mining giant, the biggest mining company in the world, Shenhua, 
went knocking on farmers' doors, ended up buying 48 properties for Shenhua's Watermark Mining Project, the biggest mining company in the world. They paid $167 million, so they escaped Foreign Investment Review Board scrutiny. Coal Works has paid $13.94 million for Currumbidi, the property where Dorothea McKellar wrote the poem, My Country. When you start turning Dorothea McKellar's property, or indeed R.M. Williams' property in Hodgson Vale near Toowoomba into slag heaps, surely it's time for the nation to wake up. It's hard to believe that the beautiful area of Casino in Lismore in New South Wales that produces beef, dairy cattle, sugarcane, nuts and fruit from rich chocolate-coloured soil that you could eat, met Gasco, have an exploration licence covering 5,800 square metres. AGL have 72 coal seam gas wellheads near Camden, a prestige suburb of Sydney. There's a 550 well gas field in the Pilliga State Forest and Conservation Area near Narrabri. And Santos are going to spend $3.6 billion to sink the wells. The Labor government in New South Wales gave a Part 3A approval for these 550 wells just before the state election. This would stretch across 85,000 hectares, including some really high conservation valued temperate forests for mining. Can you believe coal seam gas mining rights next to the Warragamba Dam in Sydney and the Somerset Dam in Brisbane, the source of Brisbane's water supply? In the next 10 to 12 years, approval has been given for 30 open-cut coal mines on the Darling Downs. 40,000 coal seam gas wells, 80 per cent of Queensland, 90 per cent of the Darling Downs. What the hell is going on? How can you allow 90 per cent of the Darling Downs to be subject to some form of exploration licence or other? Not far from Toowoomba is Felton. Magnificent. A virtual breadbasket of Queensland. Glorious grazing and food country. It produces 33,000 tonnes per year of summer grain. 10,000 tonnes per year of winter grain, 22.8 million dozen, dozen eggs per year, 22.8 million dozen, 5,700 tonnes of pork a year. It's gone. Amber Energy has a licence to explore for coal. The coal's crap, so they're going to build a petrochemical plant, as well as the coal mine. Slap bang in the middle of one of Queensland and Australia's greatest food bowls some of the world's finest agricultural land, known as the Golden Triangle in central Queensland. 14 million hectares, appropriately named, the Golden Triangle. 88 per cent of it is under an exploration permit for coal or a mineral development licence or a mineral licence. This is larger than the total land mass of North Korea. It's twice the area of Ireland. Some of the world's finest agricultural land where there are 724 exploration permits for coal, 429 of them have been granted. 14 million hectares. What is our agricultural future? Where is our food security if we either sell our best land to foreign interests or allow mining interests to plunder it? Extrata has bought 40,000 hectares of the state's best grazing land at Wandowan in Queensland. And a former consultant told landowners at a community meeting they should forget about the planned 30 million ton a year estimate for the coal mine and instead consider that the area could become the Hunter Valley of Queensland. The Hunter Valley is like a crater of the moon. And I challenge television stations, take your helicopter across and take some photos. And this is depressing. This is the new Australia. Don't worry, Anna Bly says. We'll get $3.7 billion in royalties. This is a brutal thing to say, but Anna Bly and the Queensland Treasurer Andrew Fraser should be asked to stand down immediately. If any general in war deliberately did to their troops what the Premier and the Treasurer in Queensland have done to their people, they would be court martialed. They have put at risk public health. They've put at risk public health by access to uncontaminated water and that they've put at risk the nation's ability to feed itself. Let me tell you today, farmers are at war and they feel they may as well declare it. And they're simply saying, Anna Bly, Andrew Fraser, go. The mining industry of Queensland is the upper house of Queensland. Nothing happens without their approval. 80 per cent of Queensland under mining licences, 90 per cent of the Darling Downs. Go. 
This is not in Queensland or Australia's best interests. And if the Leader of the Opposition in Queensland, not yet in Parliament, but hoping to be Premier, who sees fit to dine with Amber Energy, who are going to rape Felton Valley, if he doesn't understand these issues, he cannot expect to win an election. There are disparate influences at work here that we have never seen in this country. It doesn't matter which part of this political spectrum you sit on. It doesn't matter if you're an environmentalist or a farmer, whether you were yesterday or what you might be tomorrow. All walks of life in rural communities are ready to mobilise, and they've been working together for months. And they form friendships based on a mutual respect for the land. And those friendships will stand the test of time. And they're fighting government that has no respect for our people, our public health, our water security or our food security. They're fighting against companies that are multinational. And they're fighting because they've been sold out by government and by politicians. Well, the fight back has begun. I repeat, the Queensland Government's own website, Growing National Concern About Land Conservation, has led to a realisation that good quality agricultural land is a finite resource and must be conserved and managed for the longer term. Protecting it from unnecessary development is essential for maintaining the future productivity and efficiency of Queensland's rural industries. How does that square up with what's happening in Queensland? How does it square up with the Department of Prime Energy's map in New South Wales of petroleum title applications, current petroleum titles, gas sites and petroleum boreholes showing that two-thirds of New South Wales is the subject of some kind of petroleum gas or coal application for development. It's incomprehensible that there could be a licence to mine for coal seam gas next to Warragamba Dam, the source of Sydney's water supply. Farmers are saying they're political prisoners. If they refuse to sell their farm to the mines, they can't find buyers for the land. If you live next door to one of these outfits, your land is worth nothing. So they can't sell their land, their farms or their homes. Farmers know that government are selling out for money to mining companies that are owned by foreign governments such as the Communist Party of China. They're being sold out to multinational corporations who couldn't give a damn about the consequences for us. We're nothing more than a cheap quarry to them. And farmers are plaintively asking, why have governments turned their backs on farmers, the food producers in their own nation? Why are we forcing farmers off the land? Why are farmers being asked to hand over to foreign governments or to big multinational companies? Why can't farmers be allowed to stop these people entering their land? Why can't farmers protect their own soil? Why can't farmers protect their own water? Why aren't Australians up in arms about all of this? I was in Gunadar and Oki at those two big rallies this year, one last week. Grown men and women in tears because mining companies have torn apart their communities, destroyed friendships, torn apart a tough and proud and self-reliant people for good. They're finished. They're finished. These people feel, to use Australian language, busted and broke. Mining permits on 90 per cent of the Darling Downs. I went to school at a place called Ackland in western Queensland, a tiny little one-teacher place. Rode the horse four miles, tied it up under the pepperina tree. Prime agricultural land. New Hope Coal have bought 7,000 hectares. Get your head around it. No respect for history or heritage. The Ackland War Memorial, don't worry, will be shifted to Culpi. Move the War Memorial and remove the graves buy the houses, which they did, cart them away from Ackland and pretend that no one ever lived here. When open cut mining is allowed to take the place of cropping, as has already happened at Ackland, there is no afterlife. Methods of rehabilitating land have never been discovered, not yet anyway. All that is left behind is a wasteland, and our food security day by day is being rankly compromised. There is a mining train on the nation's tracks and it's gathering momentum. And it's about to run down and destroy the nation's food security. Anna Bly was born in Warwick. 70,000 hectares are under exploration permit all the way from Toowoomba to Warwick. 70,000 hectares. Kingaroy Joe country, bauxite exploration permits for thousands of square kilometres are focused around Kingaroy. Pittsworth, a beautiful farming country, the same story. Newmont has a mineral development licence over 13,000 hectares. They're monumental tracts of land at Felton. Go out to Dolby. You can't believe what you see. 
a veritable pincushion of coal seam gas projects. And at night time, lights as far as you can see, it's like Las Vegas. It's the home of Arrow Energy, where a couple of months ago a gas well exploded near Dolby and police and regulators had to close off the scene for safety reasons. The figures are staggering. And where I was brought up, New Hope Coal, who are looking to sell out now to foreign interests, take the rubles and run, are awaiting approval for stage three, where eventually they'll own all of the 7,400. Hodgson Vale's not far from Toowoomba, R.M. Williams country. He donated the property to the people of the community, his homestead, just up the hill from Hodgson Vale. He loved to sit on the veranda and watch young men play polo. Well, they've test drilled the polo ground at Hodgson Vale. What next? Bradman Oval? The Chinese are targeting dairy farms in Australia and they plan to produce milk here and ship it back to China. They call it from paddock to plate. Buy our paddock and put our food on their plates. Farmers have faced it all. Drought, flood, fire, the oil shocks, commodity price crashes, escalating costs of production, but farmers have never faced anything like this. A farmer wrote to tell me that there are now nine gas wells on his property, mined by the coal seam gas company Arrow Energy, acquired last year in a joint venture between Royal Dutch Shell and PetroChina, China's largest oil and gas producer. But he told me there are another 198 gas wells nearby with drills boring 24 hours a day up to 500 metres deep into the Great Artesian Basin. The Bly government's broke. Well, don't destroy farmers in order to pay the bills. Under pressure, Anna Bly has introduced a strategic cropping land policy, which I must say hasn't passed through the parliament, but the conditions are so complex and varied and demanding. For example, you have to jump through hoops like the chemistry of the soil quality if you want it to be a strategic cropping land uh, classification. The slope of the land, how many stones on the land, how do farmers deal with this? And a piece of land has to fulfil every single criteria to qualify as strategic cropping land. But it's not law. The Government of Queensland is hanging on for as long as they can so that the mining companies to whom they have made promises can get all the mining exploration started that they want. There's been an explosion of mining exploration permits granted in Queensland in recent months. Now the Government has released maps in Queensland showing areas of strategic cropping land. The total area comprised 4.1 per cent of Queensland, made up of 2.2 per cent of currently cropped land and 1.9 per cent suitable for cropping. The obvious thing would be to say to the mining outfit, we'll leave the 4.1 per cent alone. That's prime agricultural land. But the Queensland Resources Council and the mining industry have put the weights on the Bly government. So that area of land has been cut back. The final area of strategic cropping land could be as little as 1.5 per cent of Queensland. The mining industry never tires of telling us, what do you want about? What do you want about? The area of land the mining industry takes up is not very big. Well, the Queensland Resources Council claims that just 0.1 per cent of the state is under mining lease. 0.1 per cent. Well, even if we accept that argument, which I don't, excluding islands, Queensland's 1.7 million square kilometres. One thousandth of that is 1,723 square kilometres, 172,300 hectares. Not exactly small, and it's on prime agricultural land by and large. And when the land has an existing use and an income stream that could continue indefinitely, namely agriculture. But, I mean, we don't have any maps of any of this. You people may well be living in an area which is subject to a licence you can't find out. We don't have any audit in this country of prime agricultural land. We don't have any audit of the extent of mining invasion. What is the area of land that's being mined on? What is its status? Is it waste land? Is it rehabilitated land? Where is it? What areas are being explored with a view to being mined in the future? What areas are being explored for more than one resource? Coal, gas, bauxite? You can't find out. What's the cumulative footprint of the mining industry? What is the estimate of the externalities that will flow? Do we know, for example, what this is going to do in relation to dust and noise and congestion and water pollution? None of this is available. None. You don't know any of it. We're meant to take government and the mining industry on trust. Of course, the government says it will protect strategic cropping land from permanent alienation, but it doesn't define coal seam gas extraction as permanent alienation. I repeat. There are likely to be about 30 open-cut mines on the Darling Downs over the next 10 to 12 years, and strategic cropping land will not stop more than one of them. The Premier of Queensland make, makes much of saying that these are only exploration permits. 
There is no guarantee, she says, that there will be an environmental approval or lease granted. Anna Bly, I'm sorry. There has never been a coal mine in Queensland's history rejected on environmental grounds. Never. Can you imagine with the food crisis looming, 4 per cent of Queensland has already protected land, that is national parks or whatever, yet we'll end up with about 1.5 per cent as protected farmland to produce food when we urgently need strategic planning legislation that will protect from mining good agricultural land and closely settled land. And we surely have to make proponents prove why they should want environmental approval, not merely rubber stamp everything because it's environmentally approved. In agricultural Australia today, there is pressure on farmers leading to suicide. No one wants to be, and they just simply say, I'm going down the back to fix the fence. And they don't come back, they can't handle it. No one wants to be left as the last man holding out. Mining companies prey on that. No one wants to be stuck living right next door to a coal mine. The exception to that, oddly enough, is the little place of Ackland, where I was brought up. One man has become an army of one. His name is Glenn Butel. He held out in Ackland against New Hope Coal, where 60 to 100 families have left the community, and stage three of the mining development will require the purchase of another 374. But you see, once Glenn goes, no one wants to be living next to a coal mine. And if you went out there today, you'd see cavernous, gaping holes in prime agricultural land 24-7, night and day. Lights, noise, dust, people trying to survive around all this because they're not on the footprint. Houses on properties empty. No cattle, no stock, nothing. Ackland, the beautiful, polished war memorial, they're going to shift it to Kalpai. Ackland was many times the winner of the Queensland Tidy Towns competition, but New Hope have ripped the plaques down. There is no town. This is a metaphor for Australia. Gunnedah is a metaphor for Australia. Casino is a metaphor for Australia. Vocabulary is inadequate to describe what you see and hear if you go to these places, but particularly to Ackland. On the Sunday I visited the district, the place was silent. Colliery number two was an underground coal mine. My father worked there in the drought, underground. It's heritage listed. New Hope intend to destroy it. They'll be fined about a million dollars. So what? Glenn Butel's mother planted 75 trees, the first of which was in 1982 in the Tom Dowdy Park. Many of the trees have been sold by New Hope Coal or bulldozed. And even in New Hope's environmental impact statement, they concede that 80 per cent of the land is of the highest agricultural quality. And the Queensland Government website says, growing national concern about land conservation has led to the realisation that good quality agricultural land is finite and must be conserved and managed in the longer term. They're kidding. People just shake their heads and wonder how this has happened in modern Australia. Glenn Butel at Ackland stands by and wonders. The world needs to hear about the travesty that is Ackland because there are many of them. There are shonky land deals. No royalties. The land that was sold at Ackland was not submitted for tender. The council just gave it to the mining company. Many of these properties were freeholded before 1910. The landowner has the right to any mineral royalties stemming from the land, but the farmer didn't know that. So the mining companies are after that prime agricultural land because they don't have to pay any royalties. Miners are equipped with geological knowledge that has enabled them to capitalise the value of the royalty saving and, I'm sorry, rip off and rob the farmer. I make no apologies for saying to these farmers, you are being invaded. This is legalised theft. I'm sorry, they're not worth the paper they're written on. You see, environmental impact statements are undertaken by consultants hired by and paid by the mining companies. Of course they're biased. In practice, the hired consultant becomes an advocate for the mining company. Indeed, the environmental impact statement generally looks more like an operating manual than a critical and dispassionate analysis of long-term social, ecological and economic, impact, economic cost. Indeed, the terms of reference for these environmental impact statements assume that the proposal will go ahead. There is always a presumption in the terms of reference applied to mining proposals that the associated activity will have social benefits to the local community. 
There is no peer review of these so-called environmental impact statements. Why, are, why isn't there a health impact statement? Why aren't there food security impact statements? This year Anna Bly went to Warwick, her birthplace, to help them celebrate their 150th birthday. Did she tell them that Altera Resources have a mining exploration permit that includes the entire town of Warwick? And then, with all of the mining, there's the question of water. Interesting, earlier this year, the former chief executive of Woodside Petroleum, one of Australia's biggest mining companies, Don Volte, who left the company earlier in the year after six years as CEO, told the Business Leaders Forum on the day he left that he'd like to be remembered for his decision not to pursue coal seam gas, and he said he would sleep easy because of it. He said, and I quote, come back and check four or five years from now, I think one of the greatest things I will have achieved is not taking my company into coal seam methane. Well, you take the water issue. Coal seam gas mining is forecast to use 300 gigalitres a year from the groundwater system. A gigalitre is a billion litres. It's equivalent to 500 Olympic swimming pools. 300 gigalitres is 150,000 Olympic-sized swimming pools, and that's extracted by coal seam gas mining every year. Will 300 gigalitres lower water levels in the aquifers? The 300 gigalitres a year would be more than half as much as is presently extracted from the Great Artesian Basin each year. And this is called a conservative estimate. And it was in a submission from the National Water Commission that amongst hundreds brought to the New South Wales parliamentary inquiry in relation to coal seam gas. Interestingly, the Murray River area now has what are called Murray storages. Dams, Dartmouth Dam, Hume Dam, Yarrawonga Weir, Torrumbarry Weir. They're almost 100% full, thank God, they are. But farmers are only allowed 71% of their water entitlement. The miners get every bit they want. There is no limit on the amount of water available to miners. There is no limit on the amount of land that they can clear. In a recent Senate hearing, looking at the impact of mining coal seam gas within the Murray-Darling Basin, Senator Bill Heffernan's committee was told, and they're investigating this whole issue, that mining at just one Queensland site would produce three million tonnes of salt, enough to raise a pile 10 metres high and 11 kilometres long. And that's 7,000 wells. But there are going to be 40,000 wells in Queensland. There are 72 coal seam gas wellheads out Camden Way, right in the suburbs of Sydney. A company called Dart Energy is beginning to drill for coal seam gas under Sydney at St Peter's. That's the first drilling. At St Peter's, do you mind? And if they're allowed to go into production, gas wells will need to be drilled every few kilometres and connected by gas lines. There are over 13 trillion cubic feet of gas lying under Sydney. So the gas company is already into urban Sydney. What's to be done about the polluted water? Salt water can permanently destroy land. Then there's the introduction of chemicals and other pollutants into the aquifers. Surely if you have a process that carries such risk, there has to be a moratorium until we find out the truth. The whole seam, coal seam gas issue is completely out of control. Governments in Canberra, Queensland and New South Wales are taking mining companies' money and giving them a licence to do whatever they want. I've spoken to Marion Lloyd-Smith on my radio program. She's from the National Toxics Network. She said, the network's review of chemicals used by the coal seam gas industry has found that only two out of the 23 most commonly used fracking chemicals in Australia have been assessed by the National Industrial Chemical Notification and Assessment Scheme. Surely there's got to be a comprehensive hazard assessment carried out for all coal seam gas mining and all chemicals, and information is coming in every day about all of this, the chemicals used in the process, including their impact on human health, their impact on air, on groundwater and on water courses. Surely we need a comprehensive health assessment of all chemical releases associated with coal seam gas activities. We're talking about people's lives here. And we need to investigate the long-term impacts of the industry in terms of clean-up and remediation of contaminated areas, the treatment of waste water, groundwater impacts, the increased landfill capacity to dispose of coal seam gas waste products. None of that is known to anyone. The New South Wales Government's own Department of Planning has acknowledged 
that BTX chemicals are a component of diesel fuel and that diesel fuel is used as a base for many of the drilling fluids, that diesel-based drilling fluids are common. I've heard your point, but I've got something to say. <laughs> BTEX. This, this is a national issue. I welcome the charts, but the story is not yet finished, if you don't mind. I'm sure you don't. <laughs> BTEX, we won't be long. With BTEX, B is for benzene, one of the BTEX chemicals. Well, the Department of Health and Human Services has determined that benzene is a known human carcinogen, causes cancer. Ethyl benzene, that's the E, is described by the International Agency for Research on Cancer as carcinogenic to human beings. Julia Gillard had a COAG meeting a couple of weeks ago. Her top water advisor, the National Water Commission, had urged the Prime Minister and the Premiers to put on the COAG agenda the risk that water systems face from coal seam gas projects. Not a squeak at COAG. But the Gillard government is in possession of a report documenting the risks to our water systems from coal seam gas. And the government's own National Water Commission is warning of the impact of coal seam gas on water quality. James Cameron, the chief executive of the National Water Commission, said that the burgeoning coal seam gas industry has the potential to deliver significant economic benefits. Quote, but there are also significant potential risks to water and our water management as a result of the scale of the development of the sector. Government don't seem to care about the risk to water quality, the risk to health. The government is just grabbing revenue. And it's clear there is a threat to Australia's agricultural land, and yet governments have nothing on their minds but the rivers of royalty. The Australian Petroleum Production and Exploration Association has conceded that coal gas extraction will inevitably contaminate aquifers. At a meeting in Sydney in August, a spokesman for that association said, quote, drilling will to varying degrees impact on aquifers. The extension of impact and whether the impact can be managed is the question. This is Sydney, do you mind, in the middle of Sydney. And here we are talking about the potential contamination of underground water supplies, to say nothing of the exhaustion of them, as mining companies take what they like and to hell with everything else. Now the New South Wales government says we might start to do something. May I just say to you, this is to me the biggest issue facing this country. We are talking about public health. Now I could go on forever documenting what that means to the people in the Hunter Valley, but already there are experts who say that children born there are underperforming academically as a result of what has happened by the ingestion of toxicity from mining in the Hunter Valley public health. We're talking about the massive diminution of the availability of water. We're talking about the contamination of water and then, of course, all of this on prime agricultural land across Australia at a time when a former Prime Minister has talked about the importance of food security. If this isn't a major issue facing this country and if this isn't something that galvanises all Australians, including the media and politicians, then I'm simply saying Australia is in for a hell of a lot of trouble down the track. Thanks. G'day, Mr Jones. Phil Curry from the Sydney Morning Herald. Uh, welcome to Canberra. Um, uh, look, on coal seam gas, I'd suggest you'd have no greater ally today in, in this town than Bob Brown. In fact, he said this morning um, that, you know, glad to see you were backing their stance on coal seam gas and food security, that you come from the Darling Downs, uh, you're into this issue, you know about it, and you're right. Um, probably maybe we... I was wondering whether you would also agree with Bob Brown that the, the, the push for coal seam gas is part of uh, the, you know, meeting the rapacious demand for energy. And, um, and that the Greens would argue that rather than keep pursuing fossil fuels, you know, we, we need to do more towards renewable energy. Uh, would you advance the argument down that direction at all, or, you, or what is your solution if, right. if we don't go for the gas? Yes, thank you, Philip. It's a very good question. You see, uh, the most probably appropriate answer to the question is I don't think enough is known uh, about coal seam gas. There is no suggestion that if we are worried about carbon dioxide emissions, now you're well aware of my views on that, but if we were worried about that, there is no evidence yet that coal seam gas would be more effective than coal itself, if you were worried about those emissions. And that's my point. There is simply no homework done on this. What has happened via the, 
by the mor moratorium on royalties here, b governments are broke and they've just taken the money and uh, Anna Bly can see, she's talking about billions of dollars in royalties, we'll worry about all the other stuff later. Now, the potential for this to devastate agricultural land and to affect public health. Now, Frank Sartor, in his book, which is called Fog on the Hill, makes a very valid point. And he says last year he was persuaded by information that had come to him to go to Singleton to speak to a doctor who's done significant research there into the consequences of mining on the health of children in that particular precinct. He said when he went there he was so persuaded by what he was being told that he went back to his cabinet and said we've got to do something differently here. This can't go on. He says in the book that Eric Rusendahl said he would do nothing, the government could do nothing. Frank Sartor in the book said, I then learnt that my government was a prisoner of the mining companies and I decided there was not much of a role I could play. So whether coal seam gas is, if you're looking for an alternative, I'm not, but if you were, there is not sufficient evidence to suggest that it's a viable green alternative. I think where Bob Brown and I see eye to eye is the devastation that this is causing to prime agricultural land, which is what Kevin Rudd's talking about, about food security and so on. But I think you'll find, Philip, that most all of these political parties are in bed with these people. I mean, as I said before, I think the upper house in Queensland is virtually the mining industry. Now, you've got Campbell Newman uh, having a lunch with Amber Energy. I wonder did Campbell Newman say to the people from Amber Energy, you surely under my administration, if I become Premier, will not be able to proceed with this coal mine and this petrochemical plant at Felton. But then Sini is the leader of the coalition in the, uh, in the Queensland Parliament and he's got people from the gas company on his staff. I brought this particularly today because this is a document that I'm not meant to have in a way. You get it from freedom of information, you've got to fight like hell for it. And this is a list of lobbyists on behalf of the mining companies. Now, who do they get? Well, you just, for, the, a, for a start, AGL, alphabetically it's in front. So this one is a former Labor Deputy Premier, former advisor of the Queensland Premier Peter Beattie, policy advisor of the Queensland Minister for Natural Resources, former Queensland Liberal Attorney General, former political advisor of the Queensland and ACT governments, former Assistant General Secretary of the Australian Labor Party, there are pages of it, former Senior Advisor to Bob Hawke, former New South Wales Liberal Senator, former Treasurer of the Commonwealth, former Chief Advisor to the Treasurer of New South Wales. These people are paid, there's pages of them, paid by mining companies to gain access because they know the system, the system is worked and away you go, with no consequence for the damage that's being done.